The following story is known as one of the most infamous tiger attacks in human history. This horrifying attack took place deep in the Primorye region in the Russian Far East's arboreal forests of the taiga. Averaging extremely cold temperatures year-round, this subtropic landscape is situated between the Pacific Ocean and Chinese borderlands and is also home to the largest undammed river on Earth. A variety of animals, both unique and well adapted to their environment, inhabit this vast frozen landscape. A list that includes herbivores such as moose, caribou, deer, and elk, to some of the most dangerous predators to walk the earth, ranging from wolverines who are known to challenge animals much bigger than themselves, and amur brown bears that can reach weights of more than 1300 pounds, to its beautiful yet elusive snow leopards. This frozen forest land is also home to the largest naturally occurring big cat in the world, the Amur tiger. Reaching weights of up to 500 pounds and measuring lengths of over 10 feet long from nose to tail, these majestic felines have both captivated as well as infused terror into the hearts of many humans throughout recorded history. Despite being protected by the law due to their endangered population, these tigers, as powerful and deadly as they were, were no match for a well-armed hunter in most circumstances. And akin, of course, was the scenario for the other aforementioned predators. During the time in which this attack took place, the meat and pelts made from these animals fetched a seller a tremendously large sum of money in the Chinese black markets just south of the region. When it comes to tigers, however, the demand and the rewards for their body parts were that much higher, and this wasn't solely because of their low population numbers. It was in fact, in majority, traditional Chinese medicine practitioners that were more than willing to pay a pretty penny for specific tiger body parts. Their wish lists would include the big cat's penile organ, its teeth, its skin, its eyes, and even its whiskers which they would thereafter use as natural remedies to quote-unquote cure a number of minor, or in some cases, even serious illnesses. Due to the allure of these so-called business opportunities, a number of men, many of whom struggled to make a living, inevitably chose to resort to poaching in order to feed their families over a more than likely labor-intensive day-to-day job in which they'd earn much lesser pay. And when one considers that the temperatures that these men lived in were so frigid, it could cause saliva falling from one's mouth to freeze before it hit the ground, then it was no wonder why many of these men chose the quote-unquote easy way out. In the winter of 1997, former beekeeper and skilled hunter and fisherman Vladimir Markov had a friend of his drive him and his dogs to his cabin which was approximately 50 miles away from his hometown in Luchigorsk. The men arrive at the cabin a few hours later, and after helping him unload his equipment, Markov's friend heads home. Markov then settles into the cabin and begins making a few preparations for his morning hunt. Exhausted from the long and uncomfortable drive up to the cabin, Markov then whips up a quick dinner and shortly thereafter hits the hay for a good night's rest. Early the next morning, Markov grabs his hunting gear and heads out to the forest with his dogs. Whether it was meat from a boar or a deer, or pelts that he could make out of the skin of wolves, snow leopards, or even tigers, he knew that any one of these items would fetch him a good sum of money on the Chinese black market. And so there was nothing specific that Markov was scoping out on this day, meaning anything was game. As they progress through the forest, Markov brings his dogs to a halt when some huge paw prints in the snow quickly catch his attention. Upon closer examination, Markov was quick to realize that the prints belonged to none other than a massive male Siberian tiger. Re-energized and elated by the prospect of reaping the generous rewards that a kill like this would net him in the black market, Markov and the pack began following the tracks through the thick forest bush. As they got over some hills, Markov notices a second pair of tracks, belonging to what seemed to be a boar. The hunter now knew that the tiger couldn't be too far away. As a group neared the end of the trail that they were walking, 
The dog suddenly began growling and barking aggressively. Markov turns his head towards the commotion and inevitably locks eyes with a large male armor tiger, as he suspected. And as it leaned over the boar that it killed, it continued to glare at him. Despite the hunter's presence, the tiger stands its ground, which also meant that it most certainly wasn't about to give up its kill to him. Markov raises his shotgun and aims it at the cat, and before it could move another muscle, fires around at the tiger, who then flees the scene at the blink of an eye, disappearing into the thick, snow-covered bush and out of sight. Markov believed that the gunshot was enough to kill the tiger, and was now overjoyed as the boar meat from its kill would now be a bonus sell for him in the black market. After cutting himself most of the meat from the hog's carcass, Markov then follows the tiger's tracks, which now had a distinct blood-red marking on one of its prints, reinforcing his assumption that his gunshot had mortally wounded the animal. As Markov continued to follow the prints, he notices the amount of blood in them decreased with each passing step. Realizing there was no way that he was catching up with the tiger if it wasn't as severely injured as he had hoped, he disappointedly journeys back to his warm cabin for the night. After feeding himself and his dogs some of the boar meat that he salvaged, he then grabs one of the sow's hindquarters and stores it in the wellhead of his beehive. He then heads to town to trade it in for some camp supplies that he needed as well as some shotgun ammo. While Markov was in town, the very same tiger he shot to returns to what was left of its kill. Instantly noticing that it had been stripped of all its meat, using its supreme sense of smell, the trail of scent left behind by Markov and his dogs eventually leads the tiger to his cabin. It's now nighttime and Markov is back from the city, elated by the return he received from the hind haunch he traded in. Meanwhile, outside the cabin, the tiger stealthily approaches the beehive wellhead and retrieves the hindquarters stored within, obliterating the wellhead in the process of doing so. The now exhausted and injured tiger, desperately needing to replenish some of its energy, drags the boar meat not too far from the cabin and ravenously consumes it. It's important to note what has been the biggest mystery when it comes to this story, which was undoubtedly the specific tiger's psychology. The steps that this big cat took in this story from here on out were unlike anything even the most experienced animal behaviorists who had studied the incident had ever seen. After devouring just a part of the boar that it worked so hard to kill, the tiger was not even close to satisfied. After all, this was but a small portion of the much larger sum of meat that his efforts had prior guaranteed him, until the arrival, of course, of Markov and his dogs. The furious feline now makes its way to the cabin and begins scoping out the premise. Markov's dogs, who were outside the cabin, begin barking violently. The wary hunter rushes to the window to assess the situation, and as he peeks outside, he notices the tiger and freezes for a split second before snapping back to his senses and grabbing his shotgun. And for a second time, being the expert marksman of course that he was, fires and once again manages to hit the already injured tiger, who took off in very much the same fashion that he did the first time quickly vanishing from sight before Markov could get another shot at it. At first glimpse of sunrise, Markov decides his best course of action would be to make his way to his friend Dunka's cabin and request a ride back to his home in Lechegorsk. Upon arriving at his friend's cabin, Markov tells Dunka about the strange and unusual events that transpired with the tiger in the last 48 hours. Hoping to set out immediately for the 50 mile drive back to town, Markov becomes extremely disappointed when Dunka asks him to stay the night, as due to the extremely cold temperatures, he had already drained his vehicle of its radiator fluid, a common procedure for daily auto maintenance in these parts. Markov's ego gets the better of him, and he decides he will instead head back to the cabin and deal with the tiger himself, confident that killing it shouldn't be too difficult since he had already managed to wound it not once, but twice now. While Markov prepared to leave his friend's place, at the same time, the enraged and wounded tiger had made its way back to his cabin. He breaks the front door open, instantly detecting Markov's strong scent on items and furniture, which he then began to viciously destroy, enraged with anything that had Markov's scent on it. 
all his hunting tools, gear, and possessions, everything obliterated. Shortly after ravaging his cabin, the tiger then secures himself in a hiding spot beneath a low-hanging spruce tree and begins to eagerly await Markov's arrival. It's now nighttime, and an exhausted Markov has almost made it to his cabin. He makes his way towards a small path leading to the front door, and it's extremely dark, and so does not notice that there in fact is no longer a door there. As he nears the entrance to his cabin, he walks by the low-hanging spruce tree, which is precisely when he notices that his front door was missing. Frozen for a split second before he could react, the tiger ambushes Markov with little hesitation, swiping at him with its powerful paws, breaking his jaw upon its impact with his face, and begins ripping him to shreds, systematically tearing him to pieces. And although tigers usually kill gracefully, breaking the neck or the spine of their prey before consumption, sparing them the agonizing experience of being eaten alive, this tiger, contrary to its typical haunting behavior, ensured that Markov felt every bit of its enragement with him in the form of unimaginable physical pain. And without a chance to react or fight back, Markov stood no chance against the beast this time, not to mention the fact that it clearly had nothing but vengeance on its mind. Wildlife authorities and investigators later examined the scene of the attack and dissected the incident based on the state of the cabin and the many clues left behind. They found Markov's dogs, who were all killed by the angry big cat, with one of its legs protruding from the snow. They also took notice of all the destroyed possessions of his as they continued their search. In a scene straight out of a horror movie, the men then find a human femur bone with residue of flesh still on it and a patch of snow outside the cabin. They eventually come upon the hunter's partially eaten, lifeless body, well preserved from the frigid cold and with a look of sheer terror still on his face. But the story does not end here. After partially consuming Markov, it was presumed that the tiger was now on the hunt for easy prey, and fresh in its memory of course, was the ease in which it was able to kill Markov despite its injuries. The tiger later arrived at a small camp that Markov used to stay at, and recognized his familiar scent emanating from the outhouse, and in a fit of rage, remembering who he strongly seems to have considered his enemy, the tiger ransacked the outhouse, and as a result further injured itself in the process. In a bid to put an end to the now man-eating tiger's rampage, a hunting party was put together led by head tracker Yuri Trush, who was also flanked by two of his men. The three men then tracked down and killed the tiger shortly thereafter, firing an incredible 13 high-powered rifle shots into its body before it finally succumbed to all its injuries. After having subdued the beast, Trush had reported that before he fired the first two shots, the tiger had already closed in on him, and by the time he fired them, the tiger had managed to cause deep lacerations to his back, arm, as well as his thighs right before his men fired off the additional 11 bullets that would finally end the mighty cat's life. After showing off their kill to the people of the taiga back at the village, the men then proceeded to skin the big cat, and to their surprise, noticed that this incident wasn't this tiger's first rodeo with humans, as other wounds, including ones that were obviously inflicted by humans, were also apparent in its tissue. Do you think all tigers have vengeful tendencies like the one in this story? Leave your answer in the comments, and if you enjoy content like this, then be sure to check out our last episode, featuring one of the most brutal shark attacks in recorded history.